is basically a um, introduction to bareboat yacht chartering before you actually go and get yourself in a nice yacht um, and basically you know once you have your ICC captain's license and you're good to go feel confident about it um, this video will basically take you through all the pitfalls associated with bareboat yacht chartering so you can be better informed before you go and I've had good experiences and bad experiences with several companies and um, you know this video sort of covers some of the pitfalls that I've experienced personally and I wish I had known before I took uh, your charter. Um, so first of all let's cover why there's so many pitfalls to your charter. So for example um, comparing it to a rental car versus a rental yacht you have um, a good example of why the bareboat your chartering business makes no business sense whatsoever. Um, so for example this is a nice BMW which I rented for a reasonable amount of money it's hundred dollars or something per day and uh, with full coverage because I always take that and basically the rental car will cost the company let's say thirty thousand dollars and six months later um, with break-even at hundred dollars a day for basically 180 days considering you know they won't rent it every single day so let's assume they rent it 60 percent of all the days so that's basically six months and they can easily resale this car for like twenty thousand after it's bro broken even and after they've made a large profit on it so for example let's say they keep the car maybe a year or two um, they could easily get $20,000 for a $30,000 rental car and the rental car market is extremely healthy. Um, people do want to buy uh, used cars essentially. Now a rental yacht, um, they'll buy it for half a million dollars um, but then it takes them about three years to break even. So um, if you assume $600 a day for, uh, for chartering it out to bare boat cruisers like yourself It'll take 666 days to break even, or basically three years if you do the same maths, um, considering they can't rent it out all the time. So we take 60%, which is actually optimistic because of the seasonal nature of yachting. And the owner versions also have better layouts, so they fetch more resale value. So let's say they keep it for about five years, the rental yacht is really beaten up. Um, because they'll want to minimize the maintenance on it so they'll get about hundred thousand dollars if they can find a buyer who's willing to put up with the non-owner version with the tiny cabins instead of the big owner versions with large cabins so that's basically why bare boat your charter makes no business sense um, so what do these companies do to stay afloat and you know there's lots of chartering companies so basically what they do is cost shifting. They basically broker the boats out so they have other people buy the boats. Um, other people who don't use the boat throughout the year and they give them to these companies. These companies charge management fees and they basically send the boat out and they take a cut on top of that. So there's no capital costs involved. Um, the second thing they do is maintenance shifting. So they move the costs to the original owner of the boat instead of themselves. Um, so they basically shift all the maintenance cost to the owner and some owners are good at it, some owners are not so good, but typically it costs 10% of the boat's cost. Um, so a $500,000 boat will cost about 50000 a year um, in maintenance expenses. So some owners will spend that, some owners won't. And then there are basically other strategies. So basically some of these companies have to buy the boats because nobody's willing to buy it for them so they're forced to buy the boats so they will basically pretend there's no maintenance required until something breaks and then they'll blame the renter for renting the boat um, which is fairly unethical I think so these are my unethical strategies um, but they have to do them anyway um, because of the brutal nature of the business. Um, there's also double billing. They basically rent one boat 
that some systems fall into disrepair, you come back to the harbor and complain about it, they blame you and then rent another boat to you so you have to complete your vacation on the other boat. And people feel a bit trapped by this strategy because they are stuck in the middle of a vacation, now they're like, maybe their friends aboard and they feel pressurized into the second boat rental which includes, you know, insurance costs and various other costs. So they get trapped into double billing essentially. Um, so this is what I consider unethical strategies. Um, so we're going to cover boat abuse because that's the most common. And I've had both of these happen to me at various times and I've gotten out of them. Um, but I will cover basically what you should look for and um, at the end I'll finally go through um, how to avoid some of these pitfalls and you can't avoid all of them because it's just physically impossible to avoid all of them. Uh, abused boat is an abused boat and double billing basically depends on how flexible your friends are and whether they'll blame you um, for making a mess of their vacation. So, you know. Um, so the first tricks, uh, trick is anchoring without bridle. And anchor without bridle, it's a rather nasty trick. Um, basically, so they supply you an anchor which is working and they don't supply you a bridle. For a catamaran, um, the bridle takes up the slack. So it takes up the slack of the wave action which, you know, if you keep hitting the motor a few times every minute um, due to the wave action, you'll finally burn out the motor. So you do this with a bridle. So, and I've given an example of a um, example of a charter company which basically refused to give me a bridle. And they said they'll give it the next day and they never did. Um, but hey, I had it on video so I could say, you know, the motor is now your fault because you never provided the bridle. So, you know, roll clip. Okay. Yeah. And I guess it's not a rock now. Oh. Okay. Just stop. Okay. Okay. Tied to the rope or what is it? It's tied to the. Yeah, this is just the rope. Okay. Hey, do you have a bridle system or is it just like? A, what do? Like a bridle system that goes across both to take the stress of the anchor. Right now, but we can, we can, I think we can put some ropes. Yeah, I mean, over just there. yeah, bridle. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna do that. Or if you don't care, then I can just leave it like that. But you know. Well, I, I will see what we can, you're leaving tomorrow. Yeah, leaving tomorrow morning. Yeah. Yeah, and then tomorrow morning maybe we can put some bring a bridle. So okay. It will be okay. <laughs> and um, moving on. Invisible hull damage. This is another difficult trick to avoid because what they'll do is they'll claim that um, there's some damage on the bottom of the hull because they don't scrape the hull every year and paint it like they're supposed to um, or every two years. And basically what happens is the hull wears out because of, you know, uh, sea creatures and various other things. Um, and they, you know, they'll just scrape it once in a while and they won't bother repainting or recoating it so you end up with these big scrape marks across the bottom of the hull caused by them and because you haven't inspected the hull closely um, well these are blamed on you hitting rocks even though you didn't hit any rocks so you know try and prove that one um, there's also things like plastic fittings which warp uh, the dinghy is very common so you have plastic handles which warp um, because the dinghy is sitting all day in the sun and it's basically exposed to wave action and they basically just, you know, the handles eventually warp. And I'll give you an example of the handle dinghies, uh, the dinghy's handles warping. And here's an example so you can see. Um, my, uh, it's a, it was actually a fairly new-ish dinghy, but, you know, old motor on it. And you can see the handles warped, so where the rope is tied, the handle sort of um, twisted, twisted up. 
and you can see because of it's not been inflated properly as well so you know it's been sitting in the sun for god knows how long and they've finally warped the handle and they'll blame you for that if you don't have pictures or video of that so um, the third trick that they try is ropes in the props or prop strikes so they'll put stones next to the boats or they'll park the boats in a way where there's a rocky area and they'll put a rope um, next to the prop or loosely wrapped around the prop or maybe even loosely laid across the prop so you know when they demonstrate that in neutral it's fine you go ahead and the first day you cast off and boom you end up and here's a good example the submerged lines um, all around the place and there's also rocks down there so I don't know if you can see it properly but there's rocks down there so you end up with the prop strike and you know they'll charge you to pull the boat out they'll send a diver down they'll pull the thing out in, inside the water so it will be a little oil leakage and you know they'll say since we tried it in neutral and it was fine the prop damage is your fault and you know you have to take the boat out and spend several thousand on it which is of course you know complete uh, nonsense but you know that's life um, another trick is cosmetic damage so they'll do a night sign off typically these cost uh, these companies will expect you to show up at night and then they'll expect you to sign a bunch of papers saying that you know there's no uh, issues with the boat and then you come back and they'll look at it with a microscope and say there's no gel coat damage and here's a few examples of gel coat damage a um, bit of spider webbing on the gel coat um, some cracks on the gel coat cracks in the plastic covers on top of the boat um, and cracks on the side as well so you know a whole bunch of stuff um, and then of course there's floor damage um, they'll claim that you're wearing the wrong type of shoes and the shoes are in the rental contract and you're supposed to wear non-marking soles and even if you can prove that you have non-marking soles they'll claim that some of your other shoes or slippers or whatever you have do have marking soles and you must have worn them and therefore you know all the black stuff on the boat is your fault and we can't get it off and it costs a lot of labor time to get it off so here's a few examples of um, you know the black stuff um, discoloration on the gel coat so you know um, so you gotta write that out into your rental contract saying you know discoloration found on X places and you know have video and audio proof so you can claim that when you return the boat it was exactly as shown when you took it um, and then finally Another trick is toilet backflow. This is icky and really annoying. So some of these boats, actually most of them have terrible toilets. Um, and basically, they don't flush properly. They backflow. Um, the tanks are usually overflowing and um, the tanks don't work correctly. The plumbing system doesn't work properly. And then they'll claim that you clogged the toilet and it's all your fault. So that's kind of hard to avoid and sometimes you just have to suck it up and you know usually they have like a cleaning plan before and after and if you pay for the cleaning plan uh, usually it's about 200 bucks they will waive this part of the fee um, so if they offer it to you you should definitely take that on option even if it's like 200 bucks you're saving yourself a few thousand dollars so definitely take it and here's an example of a terrible toilet um, roll tape. Um, and then there's, you know, there's besides the minor stuff they do, well, some of it is major, but, you know, in general, it's minor stuff, which is not a safety hazard, as in you won't die um, with any of their stuff. 
um, on the other hand you know boats are not maintained correctly you can die and you know I'm going to cover some of the dangers with these sort of boats so the first is propane ventilation they often the problem is that vent fans fail and they find it cheaper to just put a plate across the vent and they don't understand that yeah now you have no oxygen therefore you know it's a sooty flame it's burning probably carbon monoxide and various other byproducts of the flame and you can see that in regular propane flames which are usually nice blue color you can see this one is yellowish and that's bad and they've deleted the vent and it's basically a just bad job all around um, you can't cook with this propane stove with the windows closed so you know otherwise you die basically um, so this sort of danger is very bad and they shouldn't really do it but you know they want to save a few bucks um, another type of danger is crimped hoses they will crimp badly crimp them replace hoses with duct taped hoses you know basically try and get that rubber to st stay along as long as possible and that's terrible because you know it leads to various interesting situations and I'm giving a few examples of that you know where uh, the toilet um, <laughs> where basically the shower comes off in my hand and good luck to you if you uh, you know accidentally happen to spring a leak out there and it's gonna pump water straight into the boat um, and another example of a badly fitted uh, replacement pipe which should have been fitted correctly but they didn't manage to screw it up and you know um, that basically leads to failure of the pump and you know obviously uh, if the pump fails you're responsible etc etc um, so roll two tapes Um, another danger this one's slightly more severe um, you basically have to look at the locker seals so lockers have these rubber seals where you know these rubber seals degrade and depending on the age of the boat they've all degraded what happens is a wave comes over the side it sees you know water sprays everywhere it sees that there's no rubber uh, sealing the lockers and there you go uh, water enters your boat and it stays there because it's a locker the lockers become really heavy and the nose gets pushed under water and so on and so forth until um, you have basically a sinking yacht and you're wondering what's going on because the yacht was supposed to be waterproof it's kind of you know it's a boat it's supposed to sort of float without sinking if it takes a few waves over the bow 
Um, this also goes for rainstorms. If you're anchored outside and there's rain falling on your head, you expect the boat to stay afloat, which it can't if there's like cracks in the rubber, in the locker seals, the lockers filled with water. Um, so overall, not a good situation. And I'm gonna go through tape to show you the rubber seals which are missing or destroyed due to age. And here we go. Roll tip. Um, this one is not a danger per se, but it is more of an inconvenience. But the fact is rental boats, charter boats, have no HVAC. So you have no heating, ventilation, or air conditioning. You have um, basically the hatch covers, which you can leave open and get drenched if it's got a rainstorm outside. Or you have basically nothing. Um, they usually delete the vents, um, and I'm going to show you what they do to delete the vents um, these are air conditioning vents and heating vents so they're all deleted um, rotate and finally this is a little more serious this is basically cracked hatch covers again this like the locker covers swamps the boat if there's a rainstorm um, it leads to mold problems, so you breathe in mold because the boat has no HVAC anyway. So you're stuck with the boat with mold inside. And depending on the weather, you either get rained and swamped out, or you know, worst case, you get some horrible lung disease due to the mold in the boat, or your boat sinks. So not good. And roll tip. Um, and this is another danger which is really annoying because they'll often service one engine fully and they'll rely on that so if you have an engine failure they'll put all their maintenance on one engine and the second engine will basically just sit there being neglected for years and years um, so you have one good engine one bad engine and they hope that you'll be fine if you know one engine blows up and conks out in the water or leaks um, the duct tape blows apart and the engine basically floods itself um, they hope the second engine will get you to shore um, this is a problem if you know you have two engine failure um, or you have uh, you know a problem with sailing the boat and you're relying on engine power only or you have no means of towing the boat. You're out of radio contact, nobody's answering your hills, um, you're going towards a lee shore and you're about to be swamped on some rocks and you have two engine failure. Well, it's not very good. So yeah, here's an example of one good engine and one terrible engine which is leaking oil and duct tape to hell and back. So a lot of, lot of duct tape went into this one and um, roll tip
Finally, this is even more serious. This is leaking propane and they often don't look after propane bottles and I don't know why but propane bottles with rust on them are really bad and leaking propane smells in the locker are really bad and you know um, you, if, you know in these lockers if they're not sealed I guess it will dissipate some of the propane but you know if you go smoking cigarettes or you go fire up the engines while there's a ton of propane sitting around in the boat uh, well it's a bit of a problem like uh, you know fire and explosions so a good idea to check the propane bottles and some of them will not replace them no matter how much you ask and that's sad but you know that's life um you take the risks you take uh roll tip Um, this is even more serious, this last sort of danger. Um, I'm sure there are other dangers, but it's the last sort of thing I could think of. So, bypass fuses. So, what they'll do is, you know, fuses cost money and they degrade. So, the easiest way is just to bypass fuses with wires or switches. So, instead of a switch, instead of a fuse, you have now a switch, on and off switch. And basically, it's just connected straight to the on and off switch. So, when you put it on, it's acting like a bypass fuse and when you switch it off it's off so for obvious reasons this is hazardous you don't know whether your switch has leaking current or not you don't know how much amperage is going through the system and there's no way for the fuse to stop it so you get short circuits and of course salt water and electricity not so good so uh, here's an example of bypasses roll tape And finally, what can you do to avoid these things? Um, there are obviously more dangers because boats which are not maintained will try and kill you because the sea tries to kill you every time you go out on it and, you know, boats will kill you if they are not properly maintained or reliable. And often at the worst times, you know, things will go wrong. So how do you avoid these things? Well, the first thing you do is avoid liability. So try and buy full insurance so you spend a thousand bucks extra you get full insurance with zero deductible it'll save you financially um, 
and get your own maps because they'll never give you up to date maps they don't want to spend on it they'll give you the bare minimum uh, be prepared to walk away if the boat is in terrible condition it's going to blow up sink catch fire or kill you um, be prepared to walk away and you'll lose your entire chunk of money but you'll be alive so you know that's kind of good um, if you like staying alive um, and you can stay in a hotel rent a car or even stay on the boat without moving it if the boat is not going to kill you just by staying on it so you know propane leaks and you know bad engines and stuff like that that's bad electrical failures short circuits with bypass fuses that's bad too so if the boat is really hazardous walk away from it um, also the first night always be prepared take lots of video and pictures that will save you if you have any issues uh, make sure your phone can watermark or otherwise date stamp your photos and the date in your camera is set correctly um, be prepared to dive if you really want to save yourself from hull damage especially um, get a waterproof camera dive under the boat check a video of the hull check the props clear lines clear debris from the prop area make a note of all the rocks um, and that's basically I think all you can do um, like anything else bare boat chartering is risky um, you have a really expensive object you're renting it for very little money in proportion to this uh, cost of the object so and the object is old and you're in a hostile dangerous environment um, so be prepared to take your own gear and work with the resources you came with and that's not always possible I realize that um, but you know you've signed up for something which is inherently risky and therefore you should be as prepared as possible so that's my um, little discourse on uh, about your chartering it's not perfect but you know if you really like boats and you really like to charter a yacht then you know it's a lot of fun um, but it can be inherently risky because it is a risky activity